I remember stepping back from that and saying, okay, well, what am I going to do now? I got to wrap up this business. I love finance, but I don't see this opportunity to really like help people along the way. I thought it was just going to be out of luck. I'm like, well, these, these just worlds don't exist together. And um, at the same time, I was really realizing that, well, you know, in my personal life, what I really value is, you know, is nature and um, that, you know, there's, I don't know how that comes into the business world at all. And it just feels like, like two different worlds, two different lives. And like, I wish I could integrate it, but that's not going to happen. I mean, I can get finance. I can maybe get some of this, you know, truly helping people, but I'm not, there's no way I'm going to get all three together. And so I thought it was just completely out of luck. And then I stumbled across this little tiny bank. Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO podcast. I'm Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant, and my mission is to help the world's top CEOs and entrepreneurs shift from incremental to exponential progress and create a huge positive impact on our world. Now, that requires you to reinvent yourself and transform your business. So, if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. Many people dream of being entrepreneurs, but it's not the only path to multiplying your impact. Randall Leach started out in a high-flying banking career and decided that actually impact needed to be through entrepreneurship. He had a go, failed, and then discovered a different way that played more to his strengths and his mindset to allow him to multiply his impact in a way that matters. I'm not just saying that. This is somebody who's really purpose-driven, who's reinventing the banking sector, turning it into a force for good, extremely clear on his purpose. So in the conversation, we look at that journey, what, le what led him to pursue entrepreneurship, when did he realize that that wasn't the path for him? What did he do instead? And how does he go about building out this concept of a regional bank that's currently non-existent? How's he doing that? What are the principles that guide him? And what's it taking to be such a success? We also get into the power of a daily assessment. He has a really simple tool that allows him to check in, understand where he's at, what his blind spots might be, and how he needs to adjust himself in the moment to be more effective. It's a fantastic tool that I recommend you listen to and try out for yourself. Enjoy this conversation with Randall Leach. Hi, Randall, and welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Richard. Hey, um, yeah, thank you for being here. Let's jump in. I know that you are the chief executive of, of Beneficial State Bank, and you started your career probably many years ago now in, you know, in the finance sector. And then you left and you went and set up a software company. And then you ended up kind of coming full circle and coming back to mother finance. So tell us a bit about that journey. You know, what, what, what was that about? What got you into finance? What got you to leave it? What got you to come back? Uh, well, well, thank you. And, and thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, I think how I got into it, um, it always felt like I was sort of meant to be in business. I think just growing up um, from, um, you know, um, watching my dad operate. Um, he, he ran a company for a bit, um, and I was just always really intrigued by, you know, business in high school. And, uh, so I went to college, I, you know, ma you know, majored in business and studied finance. And when I found finance, it really just clicked. I just loved it. Um, I, it was just a ton of fun and which I didn't expect it to be that much fun, but I really did enjoy it. Um, and so when I, um, was leaving school, um, I, you know, I looked for opportunities that really were, you know, just right up the middle in, in finance. And so I went to a, a national bank, which was actually a wonderful experience. I mean, there was just so much training, so much exposure, um, so many opportunities to see different businesses within the bank. Um, but what I really loved at the time was this uh, opportunity to be, I was in the commercial lending groups. So um, I got to sit across from entrepreneurs and business owners and CFOs. Um, and had just this amazing access just to like, ask them how they ran their business and how did it work. Um, so I learned a ton from them. Actually, I, I can just relate to that. When I started my career in strategy consulting, I think I did $2 billion of due diligence uh, projects 
uh, appeals uh, and syndicated debt and this kind of thing. It's a very similar experience, right? Because you get access to the very, very top level of people who are doing extraordinary things and you get to hear how they think and what they're planning and and going deep. So yeah, it's a fascinating experience. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that and I had a, um, had a great run there. Um, I, I, but at some point I started to get a little bit itchy for, for something different. And um, at the time, I, I really thought it was that I wanted to be an entrepreneur um, and that um, I should you know, head out on my own and, and, you know, see what I could uh, make happen in the world. And this was really, I'm going to date myself, but it was right around the time the internet was rolling out. And, um, so I had decided that, um, I was going to do a, um, software startup, um, basically a financial services, different vein of financial services, basically software that was going to help people that were not uh, familiar with basic, you know, finance or, uh, personal household management. So I started that and uh, I actually, I really struggled. Um, what I found was that I was not, like I had the vision for it, but I really did not have the, I don't know, the ability to really sort of leverage all the different little pieces of credibility to make it all kind of come together out of thin air. Like for me, there was something about, like it wasn't real enough and I didn't feel like, <laughs> Like it was just a long shot for everybody and it didn't feel right to sort of invite people in to take that kind of risk, I think. Um, and so I ended up, you know, embarrassingly enough, I made the mistake of not raising enough capital, but I, um, it, it really just didn't fit. It was just too early stage for me. And if I could just ask on that, yeah, what comes to my mind is one of the things I always say to my clients and to myself is the first sale right? The first sale is always to yourself. Me. So what I'm hearing is possibly in that moment, right? You weren't quite sold on it yourself, right? Because of your risk profile potentially as a banker. And you're like, I w I'm not sure I'd put the bank's money in this project yet. And it's not there, right? So can I really go and ask people? So it might or might not have been a good idea. Who knows? I don't know. But it sounds at that point, you weren't quite in your own reality distortion field enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I, honestly, the the business was, I think, um, a really good concept, and it, you know, I've seen other folks execute on it, and you know, sort of proven out the point now. But um, yeah, I was not the right player for that stage of business, and but I did find something. Along, so I, I thought I was going for this entrepreneurial sort of all star kind of role, which is, I mean, a lot of us get conditioned for that too, right? I mean, it's sort of what's big and sexy, like, hey, look at this hero out there. And um, I realized that, that, okay, that wasn't for me. But what I found on this way was that, um, that the business model was, was really about, you know, trying to help people that were sort of disadvantaged in, um, in terms of like they didn't know how to manage their money and they were trying to achieve these goals and they just didn't have um, maybe advisors or resources or the toolkit to make it happen. And so um, to be able to, try and design things that were going to just straight up help people. And it was, that was really where it was at. And that's different than what I think is, you know, all these banks and most companies talk about, you know, Hey, our sir, we're here to service you. We're here to serve you. We're here. And, and, and that's different, right? I mean, that's almost like a courtesy kind of exchange. Um, but this was really trying to like, how do you actually meaningful to achieve somebody's life in the court and to help them achieve what they want to go achieve? I'm like, well, gosh, that is really what, um, was getting me juiced. So I remember s stepping back from that and saying, okay, well, what am I going to do now? I got to wrap up this business. I love finance, but I don't see this opportunity to really like help people along the way. I thought it was just going to be out of luck. I'm like, well, these, these just worlds don't exist together. And um, at the same time, I was really realizing that, well, you know, in my personal life, what I really value is, you know, is nature and um, that, you know, there's, I don't know how that comes into the business world at all. And it just feels like, like two different worlds, two different lives. And like, I wish I could integrate it, but that's not going to happen. I mean, I can get finance. I can maybe get some of this, you know, truly helping people, but I'm not, there's no way I'm going to get all three together. And so I thought it was just completely out of luck. And then I stumbled across this little tiny bank that um, was basically restarting and trying to do some, you know, green or environmental finance. I'm like, that actually sounds like fun. I can get at least a couple of these things in there. 
Um, so I, I had joined them um, with the idea of, all right, let's see if we can build up a, you know, a commercial lending business that's focused on environmental finance. And you know, that was but over 20 years ago now. And so uh, all along the way, um, you know, I found a way to incorporate the personal values into the business model. Um, and there's no looking back. It's, it's, been, it's been a phenomenal ride. So what I'm hearing, uh, Randall, is the first clue here was in the business that you tried to create, didn't quite work out, but you realized there was something there which was important to you, right? Mm -hmm. That there was a kernel in this, which was a, a key to your own sense of purpose. I'll give you an example uh, from my own life. You know, when I, before I started my business, I created a blog when I was still in my corporate world. And the blog, I think it was called Purposeful People, you know? And, and then I left my corporate world, started my kind of coaching consulting business, I then realized, obviously, several years later, that actually what I wanted to do was to work with those purposeful people who wanted to change the world. And that was the reason. You know, the reason was I knew I wanted to do that all those time ago because I was writing about those people who were really on a mission to change the world in different ways and who wanted to be intentional and strategic about doing that. And yet, of course, I got into my own head when I started my business. Uh, perhaps I just need to do something a bit more conventional, pl play a bit lower, play a bit safer, whatever. And at some point you realize, no, no, this is actually deeply important to me. So what I'm hearing is you found this thing about, I want to support people who, especially around finance, and then you found these other areas as well that you wanted to kind of bolt on. So I think it's really fascinating how, you know, that theme ended up playing out in your, in your career. Yeah, well, you know, I think I think it's pretty common, right? I mean, we don't know everything when we we get started on the journey. Like, right? we have an opportunity set, and we pick, you know, the one that feels right at the time. Um, and the reason it feels right could be, you know, there's a lot of variables that go into it. It could be that it is the actual best opportunity, or it's the one that we feel safest with, or you know, maybe we're the most excited about, or whatever. And so we go on, you know, we start our journey. We pick up skills and perspective, but I think the pieces that really help set the course are, okay, well, you know, you got to be sort of brave enough to go explore um, externally, but also internally to know what you want, right? Like, you know, you got to be able to look inside and discover, and then based on those truths that you either find out in the world or inside yourself, you got to be able to be willing to adapt. And that's hard. Um, right, is that you have to let something go sometimes to go for what really matters. Um, and that's really transformative, right? And so you make that connection and it starts to come together and then, wow, then you're a whole new level. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we see people that aren't able to do that, right? For either because of their life circumstances um, or, you know, they're, they're not able to look inside, they're not able to, um, you know, see the opportunities in the same way adapt. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's definitely a lot of variables in there. What was the hardest moment for you when it came to letting go of something to pursue the new, to, to do the next chapter? You know, I think, well, I mean, I, it's probably different for every stage. I mean, I think when I left the larger bank, I mean, I felt like there was a lot of expectations uh, externally that like I had this, you know, good corporate job. I looked successful from the outside and it didn't reconcile with what I wanted inside. Um, and so, you know, that was um, a bit of a, you know, struggle to really come to terms with like, well, you know, who am I doing this for? Um, why am I doing this? And um, am I willing to give up what is a, like a great, you know, career path that most folks would be really enviable about? And, you know, I mean, it just sort of feels like almost like a title to be able to set it aside and kind of know that, you know, you'll be okay and you can still take a different path. That was probably the first um, struggle. And Randall, on that one, what happened? So what was the pivotal moment, right? So you're going through this, yeah, everyone wants me to stay on this safe corporate job or whatever. What, was there like a, a moment when you're like, I'm done, I'm moving on? I think actually I had passed that moment for some time. Like I, I knew that I, this was like it and I was terrified. And so I took longer than I probably should have to, to jump. Okay, so yeah, you like you'd run off the cliff and your feet were still going and you hadn't quite looked out. Exactly. <laughs> that was me. That was absolutely a little wild e. coyote action going on there. Yeah, for sure. Um, and um, 
what I think really helped was that the people that were you know closest to me, you know, my family, and, uh, dear friends, you know, talked through it, and it was like, dude, this is pretty obvious, you know. Um, and whether or not you get, you know, you fail and you go on a different career path, it, it won't matter. Um, I think also I had some examples in my life of some other entrepreneurs. Um, one uh, dear friend who had, um, you know, different different character, different profile, but I watched him be so resilient because he would go start businesses and he'd swing for the fence every time. Sometimes he'd hit it on the part. Other times he just, you know, he'd get clobbered and he'd always pick himself up again, like, all right, I'm back in. Uh, and he'd go for it again with no reservation. And I said, okay, that's not me, but, you know, I can, I can probably take some, you know, I can, I can recover. I've got enough confidence and I've got enough um, resources. And again, I mean, I think, you know, the other side of it though, is, I mean, I think growing up, I mean, I did have financial resources. I did have this sense of just that I was going to be okay, no matter what. Um, and not everybody has that. And so sometimes that can be unhealthy and sometimes it can be healthy and give you a chance, you know, an opportunity to take some chances, but. Yeah, so that that was different than when um, I left um, and wrapped up the startup because the startup one was really like, you know, I mean, this was more of a failure, right? Visible failure felt like, you know, I didn't execute well. I let some other people down. Um, I, you know, burned through some household finance uh, for my wife and I right at the time. Um, so there was just a lot of, um, you know, frustration and disappointment, which was at the same time, though, there was now a burning new energy that was coming up for what I wanted to go do next because I found something that really mattered to me. I just didn't know what would become of it. Yeah, I call that the rocket fuel, right? When you get that burning energy, this genuinely matters. Nothing's going to stop me now because I know what I want to, I know what I'm all about. I think it's a key moment, you know, when people actually latch on to something and say, this is what I want to contribute. It, and, and, you know, it's, it's actually, it's different. I hadn't, haven't in a while really thought about it, but the energy with that was more authentic and coming from within, like I knew what I wanted that would satisfy me. Whereas before, when I went to do the entrepreneurial, you know, go, you know, shoot for the moon, some of that really was, you know, some external expectation and pressure, like this is the model, right? This is what, you know, um, it's great to have corporate success, but the real the real win is to be some entrepreneur. And um, and so I think I got caught up in that when I was, you know, uh, younger. And then I realized, well, that's that's actually not me. That's not actually my path. So, but I'm able to take some of that entrepreneurial energy in a business that's already going, right? And apply it in, you know, just a different way. Um, and so I, I still view myself as a, you know, a corporate entrepreneur, not uh, as the, you know, stir startup star entrepreneur. That's not me. Yeah, I was talking with a, a, a CEO, a business owner just yesterday, I think it was, um, who has this burning desire to be, I think described it super successful. And we really had a conversation because it was basically eating him up. He's already very successful, right? I mean, he's already, but, but there's this burning desire. We kind of got into it. And it's this thing of, well, like, how do you know that you're super successful? And, and is it actually about winning love and acceptance from other people, right? Is that why you're doing it, right? Because you, often it's those deep drivers that drive us. And we, try to sh we shifted the conversation, really, from success to impact. You know, what's the impact that would really make it like? What are you really all about? And I know I can be in my head, I can overthink things, all the rest of it. But then if I really drop down into myself, I can tell you I am dead serious about impact. I don't take myself too seriously, but I know that I want, I want people to make an impact, change the world, make a difference, not be complacent. That's what I'm about. That's what I stand for. It goes back to my past. I can stand on it. And I know I'm I'm powerful when I talk about that because I 100% believe it. That's what I'm here for, right? I want to help people apply their impact. Boom, right? Um, whereas if I get into other goals, like this is the amount of money I want to make this year or this or that, yeah, I can talk about that. But it's not coming from that place of absolute conviction. It's a, it's a head goal, right? It's a, it's a, perhaps I should do this. You know, I made this much last year. I should try to aim for this this year. That it's not the same conviction as when I talk about the core motivation. So anyway, enough about that. Let's move on. Um, 
So tell us, tell me, Randall, about your ambition. You want to build a regional impact bank, which sounds great, except that it's a non-existent concept. <laughs> so you're creating the non-existent, which I love. That's what life's about in many ways, I think. Well, so what, what is it? What is a regional impact bank? And what, what's the story there? Why, why is this so big on your radar? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it goes back to, um, you know, what we were just talking about, sort of the, the personal motivation of, of really trying to, you know, help people flourish and my passion for, you know, the environment. Um, and so, you know, I'm fortunate that I've, you know, found a bunch of colleagues, um, you know, partners, investors, directors um, that all sort of share this idea that, um, look, let's, you know, build this triple bottom line bank where our true purpose is, is to serve the community in a deep and meaningful way. Right. And, and so our, you know, our mission is, is simply to, to help people, um, and help more people, right. And, and do it, do so in harmony with the environment. So, um, you know, that's, that's really what we're trying to do. And so basically we, we, we've taken the, the bank business model and sort of hacked it for good. Right. And so that like, so the a bank is an incredibly powerful, you know, financial vehicle. Uh, it's, it's essential to the economy. Um, it, you know, just uses leverage of people's deposits to make the lending activity happen, runs the payment rails. You know, it's, um, it's just in the heart of the, um, you know, move money around. So, okay, if we're going to make change, go to where there's this leverage point. And, um, you know, right now in the United States, you know, banks are for profit and they're really, you know, they're, their sole purpose is to maximize their, you know, shareholder wealth, the classic capitalist model. And it's incredibly good at doing that. It's incredibly powerful. But what happens with a bank when it uses that power for that self-interest, that just pure maximizing what it can take from both sides as a financial intermediary, and it's like, all right, let's increase our power base by taking, you know, as much, you know, we can from our depositors, as much as we can from lenders to maximize our share so that we can give it to our investors. That is the primacy um, leads to some pretty dark places. And um, so what we've done is pretty simple, really, is that like, that's not us. We're here that we're, we're in the middle, but we're not trying to create power by pushing these you know, other parties away and minimizing their power. We're more of a social intermediary. Where we'd rather connect them, make everybody stronger, figure out how we can help each other without all these sort of negative, you know, externalities, um, right? It's, it's not just about going and doing good things. You, you got to avoid doing the bad things too. Um, and so it's really about, you know, authentically um, building a business model that's going to add value to the communities in the most efficient way that you can do that. I hope you're enjoying this conversation. This is just a quick interlude to remind you that my book, Making Time for Strategy, is now available. If you want to be less busy and more successful, I highly recommend that you check it out. Why not head over to makingtimeforstrategy.com to find out the details. Now, back to the conversation. So why is that hard? What makes it difficult? Like, if it was easy and no cost, no, everyone would have done it. It's nice to have, sounds good, probably adds extra brand credibility, right? So what, what are the challenges that you've been experiencing as you build this model out? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the first one, right, is that, you know, most companies and banks included are focused on maximizing profits. And so we're, we're focused on optimizing for prosperity for the community and for us. Um, for, um, you know, um, the, you know, the environment, right? So we're, we're not, um, it's not just, you know, one facet of this. So we're, we're trying to integrate the, the, the two triple bottom line, you know, people, planet, profit. Um, and so that's sort of the first challenge is to get that, you know, that North star, that mindset, that culture, and, and really stay committed to that, um, from an organizational design perspective. But, one you know practical example is like okay so we want to serve um, low income communities low income people and provide resources to those that are you know folks that are empowered they're trying to lift themselves up against the system that's sort of working against them um, they might be trying to help others you know those are the people that we really try and serve like okay they're on a mission how can we how can we help them and 
when you when you provide services to somebody that's low income or maybe higher risk or has some kind of financial vulnerability, this question of how do you do that in a way that is helpful for them and economically viable for you, right? It's there's lots of folks that provide services to low income people, um, but you know on the extreme it gets predatory, it gets ex- uh, it's exploiting, right? And like okay. That's the classic model. How do we do this in a way where it's financially sustainable for us? Now, we're um, we're not hurting ourselves to be able to help them. And so sometimes it starts with um, not looking at that as the the trade-off. It's just like, let's just start from like a fresh look of what do these people really need and how can we help them? And then we'll back into how we can take care of ourselves along the way. Um, I think a lot of times one of the problems is that people think things are always an either or like you can either you know make money or help somebody it's like well actually maybe you can start if you start with the premise of doing well by doing good you you can still like you can make that a reality right it doesn't have to be either or just because you're doing something good means it's unprofitable that i think is the old way of thinking and if you don't explore that you can actually be successful by helping others um, then you may just you're not going to find it. Yeah, I love it. It's what you were saying there about going back to first principles and customer needs and saying how can we actually serve these people rather than kind of a basic. Well, here's our basic model. What are the parameters we're going to type in for this particular customer segment, right? And just kind of yeah, and that's what it is. We're actually, be more creative, right? Innovative, for solving these challenges. And I think the other thing I heard Randall was. Yeah, fundamentally, it was just because you, this whole bank was set up um, and designed from the start to have the triple bottom line approach. So actually, some of the things which would be hard in a traditional business become easier because you've already established the parameters, right? This is the way we're working. It, it, is, it is a different challenge to take you know, an existing business that you know, sort of makes its money with a certain business model, has inertia, I mean, you know, people have their, you know, their livelihoods or their, you know, their, their wealth tied up in that, in that business model and say, we're going to fundamentally change it. That's a, that's a hard course correction compared to like, all right, um, let's design from the beginning where we have alignment all the way through, you know, for us, you know, our, our founders, our investors, our directors, our management team, our staff, our governance model, right? I mean, it's in our bylaws that, you know, we're going to be that we're a, um, a public benefit corporation. You know, we're a B Corp, um, so we you know we really are committed to um, the practices that that make a you know triple bottom line organization. So everything that we do is designed to support and buttress that. And we're just you know our so what our model is is we just keep incrementally you know trying to improve that and learn and adapt, right? Um, which is just very different from an institution that was doesn't have everybody on the same page, doesn't have everybody going in the same direction. Um, there might be some folks in the organization who want to do that, but you know, it's going to take a long time for something like that to shift. And it's a question of can it or will it, uh, or will it shift, shift enough for, for what we need as, you know, for our society, for our planet, um, because there's real issues that need to attend and we all have a stake in it. Uh, and if we don't start getting after it better, more effectively than we have in the past, um, it's, it's, it's already, it's already a problem. And it's going to get a heck of a lot worse. Yeah. I think actually you're right. I think it's incredibly hard to change existing institutions of, of many sorts, right? Because you're trying to negotiate some kind of consensus. And yet the only consensus that you have was that you're all kind of prepared to tolerate the current situation because you're there. <laughs> and therefore if you might have progressives and conservatives within that, but it's incredibly hard to move people together. I've seen that in many different sectors, uh, business, business. Yeah, I mean, it goes it goes back to the question that you you asked asked me as as an individual, as a leader, and sort of those moments of when I reflected of what I was going to let go for what I was going to go forward with, right? So, as hard as that is to answer as an individual, asking you know tens, hundreds, or thousands of individuals to do that at the same time. Uh, you know, that's, that's monumental. So I think some, you know, sometimes the, the change has to happen slowly and, you know, um, you know, for, and you know, that's how you sort of build a movement and then suddenly, you know, it can pick up some steam, but 
I mean, it's hard to deal with in an institution, especially a bank. A bank is um, not built for change. It's not built to adapt. It's built for, you know, control, steady process, um, risk aversion, right? Well, theoretically risk aversion, not all banks subscribe to that, but. <laughs> well, here's a, here's, a, here's a kind of field analogy. You know, it's like, think of what would have to happen to persuade priests in the Catholic church not to wear robes. You know what I mean? There's like, you know, yeah. for other churches, people don't wear robes, but like, can you imagine trying to change that institution and roll out a new policy? You know, it would just, that would take hundreds of years. It's probably impossible, right? So changing institutions from the inside out, I think is really, really hard work. So I think the beauty of the economy is that new things can bubble up and new models can emerge. And some, some will change, but I think for many, it'll be very hard to shift focus. So let's shift gear again, Randall, and talk about your, your personal um, disciplines, actually, because I'm always a believer that leaders who look to multiply their impact always have specific practices that help them to do that. And I know that one thing that's important to you is what you call a self-assessment. I think it's a daily practice for you. Um, so just tell us a bit about that, you know, and, 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 how, and why do you do that? And... Uh, What's the benefit? Well, yeah, I mean, so I mean, some of this goes back to what we were talking about before, right? As, um, you know, look, so one level, you know, looking out at the world, you know, based on your vantage point, you see what you see um, and trying to be really clear eyed and objective about that is, is, is an essential sort of skill set and practice, um, in my view. Um, and then one of the things that I've done. And it's not just like a daily, sometimes I'll do it like 10 times in a day. Um, it's just a simple tool. And I've got, you know, a few different ones I use, but um, I just sort of take an inventory of, okay, well, wait, where am I, you know, spiritually, you know, emotionally, uh, physically, um, you know, intellectually, relationally, um, where am I right now? And, um, and sometimes it's like, good, 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 yeah. And then it's like, okay, well, wait a minute. What was that? Yeah, let me go sort of dig in a little bit deeper there. Um, what's what's going on? And really just try and um, bracket a little bit and explore it. Um, both the, the negative and like, you know, the positive. And um, it's just a simple reminder for me to, um, you know, explore inside a little bit and, and, know and get a better sense of what sort of energy and um, what I'm really bringing to the day or what I'm bringing to the moment. Um, because, you know, then you can adapt, right? You know, if you have a better sense of what's really going on with you and the world is what it is, um, that then I've got a chance to say, okay, well, wait a minute. If I'm off, you know, um, emotionally or something, like maybe I'm really sad or something that I can actually buttress myself for what I, need to go do next. Or I can say, hey, wait a minute, this is actually something I need to go take care of. Um, and I can, you know, make space for myself to do what I need to be able to do. Because um, look, we're all, we're all human. And sure, it's one thing that you can, you know, sort of put, put things on pause for a little bit, but um, I don't think it's good or in the best use, um, best potential for anybody to try and just put everything in cold storage forever, right? So um, it's really about, um, just seeing where I really am at um, so I can kind of show up better and show up more authentically. Yeah, that's nice. I have a practice which I've been doing recently um, where I look each day at how inspired am I, uh, how engaged am I on, on my top kind of most uh, biggest project and, uh, and how, how, much enjoy, how much am I enjoying things. And the reason for doing that is well, these are really from like my biggest, what I call my impossible goals, things which I don't even believe I can do, but I want to do them anyway. And it's like, well, if, if I'm not inspired about it, you know, engaged and kind of all in, and if I'm not having fun, then like there's no way I'm going to bring the creativity, the connection, the energy, the magic that's going to make those things happen, right? I may as well literally just shut my computer and, you know, take some time off. I do some dishes or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually, it's a great prompt. It's like, okay, 
if I'm not feeling that at the start of the day, I will go on mid. Like, yesterday morning, I was not, you know, I was, it was a Monday. I just got back from a week's vacation. You know, the family were asleep, you know, and I was starting work and I was not in the zone. I was really not in the zone. And so I was like, you know what? Like, let me go for a run. Let me actually remind myself what I'm all about and get to the place where I can actually score myself high on those numbers. And only then do I actually do my work. Because when you're in that place of being creative and energized, you only need that one idea, that one connection, that one message, that one article, whatever you're going to do that day to make a difference. So I love this idea of yours of, uh, of rapidly kind of just checking in, which can be once a day or once, a, once an hour, whatever, or just pausing, I guess, as you're walking from meeting to meeting, just doing a quick check as to how am I showing up on those different levels. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's another sort of part of this too, is, you know, part of my own, I don't know, personal perspective or sort of how I, I look at a lot of things is that, okay, there's, you know, everything's sort of a bundle of attributes, right? Um, and in some, you know, so, I mean, if you could take a simple one, just like, you know, physically, whether somebody's tall or short or strong or, you know, like can lift a lot of weight or something like in some situations, that's going to be a tremendous advantage in other situations. No, it's not. It's going to be a disadvantage. And so when I do this, it's basically, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for things that like, just where, where am I? Because just based on what I'm going to go do next, I might realize, Hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm super strong on this right now, but that's actually not what's needed. Um, that might, you know, maybe that one in a different situation would be phenomenal, but that's actually not what's appropriate. Um, you know, I might be having a really tough conversation with somebody and, you know, there's a different energy that is needed than what I was coming in with. And it's just a simple way to check and be clear what, what I can bring to the table. Yeah, I love it. So, Rando, as, as our time is drawing up to a close, let me ask you a couple of my favorite questions. Uh, so my favorite question is probably uh, is around multiplying impact. So what would multiplying impact look at the bank level? Like what, what would you love to create over the next few years? With the bank, what been amazing? You know, what's the next level? Sure. Well, you know, we're 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 just a a, a tiny bank, really, in the, in the grand scheme of things. And um, what we're really trying to do is is build a really you know um, a business model that can really add value to the community. It's really can contribute um, and not do any of the negative, right? And that it's really about optimizing what, how we can help people flourish, um, how we can help the environment, how we can help strengthen the community. And what I think is really exciting is when you look at like our impact measurement and, you know, how many units of affordable housing it can be, or, you know, that, you know, how we're providing access to credit to folks or, you know, by, by whatever measure, if you take our institution, um, which is just a fraction of 1% of the total economy, if you had 75% of the institutions with a similar business model, the impact that you would have on affordable housing, you know, giving, you know, safe and, and uh, economically affordable housing to people, uh, what you could do for the natural environment. Uh, it's just absolutely profound. So, so many of the social issues that we face, so many of the environmental issues we face, and the economic disparity, that if you scaled this model, um, you'd be really solving these, these issues by simply reallocating capital uh, in the market. So, harnessing an existing tool that's out there, uh, using the power of it for good um, and doing that at scale. Um, it's, it would be profound. And as you look at seeing how you can be part of that profound impact, what are you going to need to do differently to multiply your own impact? There's always a shift, right, in how we operate because what got us here won't get us there. So what comes to mind, I talk about what, what you might need to work on yourself if you're going to move, reach your next level? Well, there's there's a lot of work. I don't know if you had time for a podcast for all the work that I need. Um, but I, um, honestly, I, I think it's really, it's about, um, you know, harnessing the, the, the power and the energy and the spirit of, of others that are out there, you know, willing and, you know, trying to make things happen and um, just, you know, helping support them as much as possible. So me as an individual, um, us as a business doing it in a sort of a, a, a structure, a platform way, um, that's where the real power comes from. It doesn't come from, from me as, you know, 
one one guy, right? Like that's um, that's not that's not enough. Um, there's way more energy, way more skills, way more potential of all everybody else that um, you know that's trying to make some good things happen for others. So how how can I be of service? I mean, that's really my model. Of how can I do that part better? Mm. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. It's uh, it's I think it's great to me. I think what I hear in what you talk about, Randall, is you go back to these same things very, very clear about contributing to the community, helping people flourish, the environment, right? Not doing anything negative. Uh, these are, you know, it's clear that it's very, you know, cut you through like a stick of rock. You might not have rock in the US. I keep talking, giving this, this, this analogy, people don't understand it. You know, it's a candy, it's a candy, a stick of candy, and it's got the, the same word all the way through the candy. So whenever you bite it, you can still read the town it was made in, whatever. And it sounds like cut you through, you're going to find the same, you know, the same word in the middle same set of words uh, around what you're up to. So I love that. It, it is really. I mean, you know, I think, you know, you, you had touched on it earlier. Um, you know, we had talked about, you know, before I had the ability to have this vantage point where I could see entrepreneurs and, you know, it's really fascinating to see how they operate their business, but also their personal relationship with money. That, that was fascinating. And it's actually now I've got this incredible vantage point of all these people that are working to help others, to make other things happen, um, to lift other people up, to, to help, you know, um, help lift themselves up. It's absolutely beautiful, really. I mean, I mean, the, the love in the community and, and people coming together to support each other, that's what it's about. Um, it's incredibly powerful. Um, I, I didn't really sort of ever tap into that, like a business had anything really to do with that before. But it's like, well, if you're able to align with that, it's 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 incredible. And like, why would I do it any other way? Um, so to me, that's where it's at. Beautiful. So Rado, as we wrap up, if people want to get in touch with you or find out more about the bank, where do they do that? Just visit us, beneficialstate.com. Uh, um, we're uh, West Coast United States and love to see if we can partner and help. Perfect. Hey, Rando, it's been great to, uh, great to chat. I <laughs> love your story and of the impact you, you're trying to make and reinventing the banking sector uh, in, your, in your own little part of the world. So thank you for your work uh, on this and look forward to following you along as you continue the adventure. Thank you, Richard. Cheers, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's a wrap. If you received value from this conversation, please do leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd deeply appreciate it. And if you'd like to check out the show notes from this episode, head to xquadrant.com slash podcast where you'll find all the details. Now, finally, when you're in top leadership, who supports and challenges you at a deep level to help you multiply your impact? Discover more about the different ways we can support you at xquadrant.com.